want to do with this panel is peer a little further into the future with some of these phrases that get thrown around, um, like Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, quantitative analysis, and, and so forth, to see where, where, where is the world of finance going to be in 10, 15 years' time. I'm going to start with, um, with, with Igor, because we haven't really talked a lot about uh, how these... Uh, financial technology trends are changing the investment process. We've heard a bit about robo-investors altering our personal finance planning, but in terms of the actual search for uh, alpha in the financial markets, how, uh, Igor, Igor, tell us a bit about how you're seeing the role of technology um, evolving and you know, initially where, where we've got to so far, but how you think that points us forward to the future of of that large-scale investing in you know, the next 10, 15 years or so. Thank you. Uh, well, over the last uh, 10 years or so, we've been seeing a, a rate of change that's uh, exponential, and things are changing faster and faster each day. So we've learned not to be surprised by anything. So for example, uh, we used to have a uh, when a company started out, we only had one trading signal. Now we have close to uh, two million trading signals, and it's growing and growing. What do you mean by a trading signal in this sense? A uh, trading signal is uh, an algorithm that examines a piece of data and uh, comes up with some strategy uh, that makes money out of that particular signal. So if you think of all the information out there, how do you monetize it? Right, uh, it would be great if there was a uh, one great big signal, one great big alpha. That great big buy or sell. Or yeah, <laughs> but but uh, you do not have that. That, that, that. That's why you need to get granular. That's why you need to uh, look at each particular piece. So uh, it, it's been growing. It's been growing very fast. It's been growing uh, because uh, technology is growing, because uh, data is growing. We have. 600 data sets going up to uh, you, you know thousands of uh, data sets and then, then we have each particular trading signal and trading signals uh, and uh, if you look at our chart you, you'll, you'll see a clear exponential uh, growth there and that's that's an indication of things to happen and the interesting thing about exponential growth is it's very uh, mind-boggling and, and, and surprising. You have to set goals that are kind of, that sound crazy today. You know, uh, first we set the goals for, for a million alphas, then we had a million alphas. Now we have a goal of uh, 100 million alphas. And it just keeps uh, going and going, and uh, really there is uh, no end to it, because the world is changing, it's growing. And so, I mean, give us a characteristic of, you know, what's the sort of data you would have been routinely using 10 or 15 years ago as an investor compared to what, what, what sort of data sets you're starting to see, you know, delivering value now? Yeah, 10 or 15 years ago, there were, there were very uh, few kinds of data available. One, of course, was the price and volume data, you know, earnings uh, estimates, things like that. Today, you see... Uh, Everything out there, you see things like, uh, you know, how many cars are parked in a parking lot in front of a particular store at a particular time. And you can, uh, you can analyze that and you can come up with a, a sales uh, forecast based on that. And that's uh, growing and growing. So uh, my uh, argument is uh, as we deal with more and more data is that uh, really every company is a data company. Also, everybody is a data company because what you do during the day has information, and that information has value. Where you go, where you look at, where, where, what you shop, how you brush your teeth, and et, et cetera, et cetera. It's all So you're actually, value. there's actually data on how you brush your teeth now that... Uh... Is my well, I'm, I'm, uh, spying on me? I was a little <laughs> fantasizing here, but uh, I think it's not too far. But there are, but there are companies that are tracking 
how many cars are in front of a Walmart or whatever at any given time. Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's a reality. There are companies tracking that. There are companies that uh, look at uh, pictures of farms from space and see how the colors change through the air and see which farms are better than others and invest in them. Uh, it's, the world is really changing. And so what do you see as the next step forward in that respect from here? Just more and more data or different? The next step forward is uh, when everybody realizes they're a data company and they start selling their data, the amount of data is going to take yet another big uh, increase up. And, he, and you see data exploding in, in uh, many dimensions. For example, in the uh, area of uh, genome sequencing, the, the cost of genome sequencing are dropping down uh, even faster than uh, exponentially. So uh, everybody's DNA, you'll be able to go to uh, CVS and get your uh, DNA sequenced. So just imagine the immensely huge amount of data and the amount of prediction you'll be able to do from that data. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really going to. And how, just one last question before we move on to the rest of the panel. I mean, how is this changing the structure of the, the businesses that profit from, that try and make a, make a living out of investing? I mean, what, what, what's, what's the implications of that? Presumably you have to be much bigger to find, have enough capital to be able to invest in searching for two million alpha trading signals? Well, yes and no. In, in a way, uh, you have this thing that, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in, in a land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, so the more you can uh, see, the better off you are. But uh, from the opposite angle, all these people uh, who uh, were not able to uh, get access to data and were not able to write their own trading strategies are able to do it now. So from both directions, uh, it's converging. On, on one hand, you, you have these mega companies with uh, access to tons and tons of data. And on the other hand, you have the, the individuals. But are you seeing a lot of disruption in terms of which firms are able to attract money, institutional money to manage? Well, the firms who uh, have an idea of what's going on and who see the trends we are going to uh, prevail in the long run. And the individuals are going to prevail in the long run. And uh, I don't want to say anything about who is not going to prevail. But uh, a lot of old-fashioned thinking, uh, which uh, used to work and used to be different, is now becoming very uh, clustered and very uh, correlated to each other. So uh, there's more and more to see out there. And how can you see it? You can see it using computers. You can see it uh, using data. And if you can't see it, then uh, you better have some uh, deep fundamental insight on a very narrow topic. So Hillary, um, you know, I think the, 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 the phrase machine learning has just really become ubiquitous this year. You know, it seems to be, you know, uh, everyone thinks it's going to transform their industry. Uh, possibly we're all going to be out of jobs because of machine learning, if you believe some of the uh, sort of scaremongering about the future of the, the workforce. I mean, tell, tell us, you know, what, where, what, what is it? Um, just in case we don't, you know, actually know what the definition is. And, uh, you know, where, how real a force is it now and how much impact will it have over the next 10 or 15 years? It is a really good question. So I will preface my answer by saying I'm a computer scientist and I've been working in machine learning since the beginning of my academic career when it was much more of an academic backwater and a little subfield of AI. Um, and AI also means something different today than it did uh, even five years ago. Um, the, the academic field of AI has been around um, pretty much since the 50s. Um, Fred Brooks, one of the, the great early computer scientists, went in 1958 and he said, who deserves to have his 
and of course it was his, but intelligence augmented with the new computational frameworks we have access to in 1958. Um, and then here we are today. And I think what we're seeing in, in this community is a shift from using the language of big data, which was really about realizing that the cost to ask simple questions or count things in massive data sets had declined so dramatically that now you did not have to be a big financial institution to have the ability to invest in technology for using that data. Um, and we spent a good, we as a broader community, a good decade sort of building out that infrastructure and building it up to the point where it is today largely commoditized. And what we're seeing now is what happens when you say, okay, I have all my data. It is in a data lake or a database or structured data, unstructured data, it's over there. What the heck do I do with it? And that's where machine learning um, has become much more popular because we're shifting from talking about the data itself to the algorithm or the ability to actually use it effectively. And when we talk about machine learning, um, we're really talking about a couple of families of mathematical techniques for deriving value from that data. And value comes in the form of being able to recognize and classify <coughs> items that were not previously understood but follow patterns that were in that data set we had access to, or the ability to infer structures and patterns in large data sets. Um, as to where we see it actually today, what we do at Fast Forward Labs is applied research with an eye towards machine learning techniques that will be practical to use for large-scale deployed products and business lines in the next six months to two years. So we are seeing a big change um, in how people are able to predict using data in um, building systems that take disparate data sets and actually combine them intelligently in understanding that most of these systems will not return a yes or a no answer, but will return a distribution of possible futures with confidence intervals that let you make very good decisions um, in a risky environment. And so that's, uh, that's sort of where we are in reality. And so if you look at the, the range of clients you have, I mean, you were saying before, I mean, it, it ranges from generating celebrity gossip through to financial <laughs> uh, disruptive the thing that products. So talk, talk a bit about you know, where you see the changes really. Right, so, um, so we have a model where we do this independent research and then we're basically nerd friends to people who are actually running businesses. And typically these opportunities are in large legacy companies because they have generally as a side effect of operating their business, gathered an interesting proprietary data asset. And today in 2016, a lot of people are starting to ask themselves, what can I do with this? What does a good strategy look like? And how do I find you know, the money, right? Um, and that means that the, the projects we see people actually implementing today tend to be of the form where we will automate something we already pay people to do. Because that's an easy thing where you can point to a dollar value saved. What happens once we see success with that is that people say, okay, now let's try and automate or use machine learning for something that we never would have been able to pay people to do, um, something new, a new product, a new idea. Um, and that's where things are getting really exciting. And so we are, are talking about projects that range, and again, the data is what brings, brings this all together. It's not just one industry. Um, but they do range from generation of celebrity gossip, um, automating risk and regulatory filings, um, chatbots with context. So I don't know how many of you have jumped into Facebook Messenger and actually tried talking to these things, but the vast majority of them are just templated responses today. There's a lot of potential there, but it, it, we have a long, long way to get there. Um, and so looking at, at all of those sorts of, uh, of capabilities. And as you, as you roll forward 10, 10 years or so, I mean, do you think finance is going to be radically transformed by machine learning? In 10 years, absolutely. So I did say we, we tend to focus on two years. And in the two-year time frame, we are not going to build generalized AI. Uh, we are not going to replace anyone's job. In fact, the majority of work we do in finance today is designed to help augment the ability of human investment managers to do their job effectively. It's not to replace them with automated systems, but in the 10-year time frame, then perhaps we'll see some of that happen. So Stefan, the Internet of Things, I mean, this gets banded around a lot. It seems we've been predicting it for a very long time. Um, is it starting to really 
happen, this connectivity between machines, machines talking to each other, and you know, what's the role of financial services in that? Yeah, it's, it's one of those, it's a classic example where you sort of take, take a, a buzzword uh, and sort of unbundle and say, well, what does it actually tangibly mean? I mean, I think there's, there's one part, which is the, what I call the follow the consumer model, which is consumers have essentially evolved from going from point of sale to the browser to the mobile device, and now through a whole host of newly connected devices. So that's sort of a natural progression that you're seeing in terms of consumer behavior. I think the other part is, uh, and you sort of mentioned it quickly, which was the idea of not necessarily looking at this on a device by device basis. Uh, this isn't about, the Internet of Things isn't about uh, you know, adding digital experiences uh, within a particular device. That's one part, but there's a reason why it's called Things. It's the idea of how those devices then connect to each other. Um, and this all comes into how do you improve and continue to improve the experience that exists uh, from an individual level? How does that experience become more contextual? How, does, uh, how do I remove some of those points of friction? So certain behaviors that I, I, I use a certain device for, uh, their ability to sort of translate that data, that information to another device, the knock-on effects for that. Uh, that's really this idea of it's really about an operating system. It's an ecosystem you build of multiple devices, not necessarily just basing it on a single device delivering one particular use case. So what do you, so, so MasterCard, where, where are you in that whole universe of Internet of Things? Yeah, but it's, 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 you know, we are known as being a, a legacy payments business, uh, but I think we, I, we sort of, I, I think about us as much, we're much more of a technology company, so we're actively testing a number of these kind of early, early stage capabilities uh, within our own organization and thinking about it, how does it not only impact uh, the banking environment, but also uh, the retail environment, the social inclusion environment, uh, the government involvement as well. Um, so we're actively testing within this space. There's a, a number of what I call some of the earlier stage uh, IoT devices, specifically things like wearables, uh, where we essentially you know, built mechanisms to embed payments within uh, those particular devices. Um, what kind, be, be very specific. Sure. I mean, what, what kind of things are you testing? I mean, so a, a great example is the work we've been doing um, with this particular device here, which is my, my Apple Watch. Um, so security is one of those kind of foundational elements which will exist in, in the IoT environment. Um, so obviously we built sort of the Apple, the backbone behind Apple Pay in terms of encrypting the consumer data here. Um, so I'm not only able to make a payment through this, but I'm actually in, able to make sure that I secure the information that the consumer provides. So that's one, one mechanism. We've also been looking at um, the working part with partnership with Samsung uh, more recently to actually enable a, a sort of retail shopping environment within a fridge. Uh, that's something that's actually live today in the US. So the idea from a consumer perspective, I can shop for multiple merchants all within the comfort of my own, own home, uh, all within a very simple and, and streamlined UI or user interface, user experience. I mean, is there, I mean, is there anything very difficult about that, that technology? I mean, is it simply, you know, as things become connected, it's just extending the reach of the payment system, or are there, you know, particular subtleties or challenges when you've got your fridge ordering your milk yeah. for you? Or so, I mean, it, it is. I mean, it does on the surface sometimes seem uh, fairly straightforward, but actually the complexity of how uh, so I'll take the fridge example. Uh, the idea of integrating with multiple merchants, uh, leveraging sort of their API capabilities so you get real-time view on inventory, uh, the logistic capabilities behind that, that, that will constantly evolve and constantly iterate. So that, that's one thing which might seem fairly straightforward, but actually is, is fairly complex. The other part is the actual uh, encryption. So the technology around ensuring that you're securing information across all endpoints is actually fairly complex in terms of how you, how you actually enable and empower that. Igor, I wanted to come back to, to one other topic that's on the, uh, t in the title of the panel, which is quantum computing and, and the potential for that uh, as innovation happens in that area to, you know, I guess, greatly increase the speed and sophistication of processing data and so forth. Are you starting to see anything coming to market there that could be a game changer? Well, we, we're always interested in the best and the latest technologies, and quantum computing has a really a potential to be a game changer. There are companies out there that uh, can do certain things 100 million times faster than normal computing. And if you think about 100 million times faster, it's really a tremendous difference, especially for us. You know, as, as we're examining seas of data and then uh, looking for 
new signals. So some, something like this, uh, a change in an area like this would uh, really push an industry to a new level. And there are signs that uh, it's happening. We're looking at uh, companies that are doing that. And there's a very good chance that uh, you know, we, we, we're going to reach a new level that we can't even uh, conceive of. Just like uh, 20 years ago, we could not conceive of where we would be today. Today, we, we cannot conceive of where, where, where we're going to be 20 years from now. So it's causing uh, all kinds of changes, all kinds of uh, paradigm shifts. And uh, interestingly enough, it's, it's causing uh, globalization, too. Because uh, you know, he, he, historically, uh, if you look at talent and opportunity, talent has been distributed globally always in a statistical fashion, but opportunity was not. And now uh, we're going through through changes where the opportunity is uh, reaching the places where the talent is. Different countries, uh, different places uh, through the internet, through uh, all kinds of technologies. You, you have these seas of data. Who's going to examine it? Who, who's going to get the value? And I, mean, and, and I guess this touches on a point that Hillary brought up. I mean, to, to what extent um, you know, does all this require humans to be, to be involved? I mean, do we still have, do we need traders anymore? Why doesn't the whole thing just get, you know, rather, rather than sort of, you, you say we need the talent from all over the world. I mean, do we actually need people at all if the quantum computers and the algorithms are going to do it all in a flash? We always need people, because uh, what, what, what's changing is just a level of, of abstraction. Right, a uh, long time ago, people used to uh, program in uh, assembly language. Then they used to program in basic, and then uh, this and that. And the level of abstraction is always changing. So uh, at, at the top, someone still has to manage the process and to manage the, the, the search process. Where so we're within, looking, within, your, within your company, you're still getting, ultimately, someone decides whether to press the trade the button and say that's yeah, the just trade. The, the trade is getting more and more abstract and more and more complicated. Mm. Do but the thought yeah. here as well. So one of the the things that's important to keep in mind when you think about do we need people at all is what machines are actually capable of doing well, and they are only capable of doing well things that match a pattern that they've seen before. And so when we talk about automating, um, like we wrote a prototype that automates the real estate advertisements, for example. So it takes the structured data of it's a three bedroom, two bathroom apartment on Fifth Avenue and it writes the ad for you. But that um, comes from the, the repeatability and the lack of creativity, to be honest, in that corpus of data, meaning that Wherever you need to make a purely creative decision or strategy change, you still need a human mind, at least now. If you're doing something that you can learn from a data set how to repeat, then no, it's a cognitive drudgery. It's a waste of human talent. Right, so how far off is this moment where the machines can think better than the humans? Because I mean, I guess we've, we've seen Watson you know, has achieved a lot of publicity for, you know, Winning, um, is it Wheel of Fortune or no? The um, Jeopardy. Jeopardy, one of those games I never watch. <laughs> um, but anyway, it beat humans there, and, and it's also one go, I think, which is also seen as being much harder to win than chess. So there is a sense that there's that they, they they are they. I mean, these are. I mean, I, I guess Jeopardy in a way because it's more contextual. <laughs> it's more interesting. In a way, because it does seem to be surprising ability. Yeah, we're going to need something heavier than water for the philosophical piece of what does it mean to think, yeah. <laughs> what does it mean to be intelligent. But as for where the technology is, it is very good at solving narrow problems with sufficient data or simulations. So if you think about how many games of Go, AlphaGo played. Um, to learn to play that well. It's more games than any single human could have played in, in lifetimes, right? Um, and it's not particularly good at much else yet. So we are very good at building these systems that can automate behavior inside very narrow applications where there's sufficient data or simulation capability available, 
but we're not, we have to next look to broaden those step by step. We're not able to say, okay, we can do this thing and that thing, so we can do everything. We're not there yet. I mean, you know, when you hear Bill Gates talk about the existential threat to humanity that AI poses, I mean, so, so they're really thinking many decades ahead, are they, you feel, at this point? I mean, I have trouble with that discussion because then I go back to my office and see AI doing the stupidest things you can possibly imagine. <laughs> think Give us some others. examples. <laughs> Oh, you know, um, you know, writing real estate ads that uh, you know it doesn't know it has it has two bedrooms, it has five bedrooms, it's on the park, it's on the water, right? You know, there there are uh, there's so much work to do um, in even getting these systems to work with a level of success that is acceptable for for non-critical applications. That um, that I don't think there is an existential risk. Um, that said, there is perhaps a risk when we put uninterpretable automated systems in a workflow where we need to have the ability to understand why decisions were made the way they were. And interpretability in machine learning is the ability to understand why the algorithm did what it did. Um, and it's currently a very hot topic of discussion. So I'd sort of redirect the existential threat into one that is a real threat today, where we put machines in place in processes and criminal justice in our communication, and we don't know why they're doing what they're doing. And what are you saying? I mean, in MasterCard, are you doing much on the machine learning front? I mean, we are, yes. Yeah. So we, we've got, we get teams internally that are, are sort of leveraging that as a capability um, and looking at kind of interesting ways that you can, you can build out, uh, again, different types of experiences I think there was a reference in the previous panel to this idea of kind of conversational commerce uh, or the idea of sort of messenger being used as a, a primary mechanism for an individual uh, to essentially engage and interact. We're doing a lot of work in, in that space in terms of uh, what does that look like? How do I layer in not only payments within that environment, but also uh, retail experiences, banking components. So a lot of that's, you know, that experience is all powered uh, directly by, by machine learning. Uh, we're also actively, and have been working with a, with a company in the UK focused on um, the internal value of using sort of AI specifically around knowledge management. <coughs> um, and essentially, how do I essentially take uh, information that sits in, in somebody's brain, uh, extract that and make that sort of digitally available and sort of a great example of that is how would you take that into a call center environment, potentially take the smartest person that continues to answer the questions that a customer wants to have extract that knowledge and make it free to essentially everyone that you onboard. So suddenly you're able to better predict, better anticipate the types of questions that will be coming up. I'm going to throw it over to the audience in a second. I just want to ask one more question about something you mentioned, Igor, which is the, all this genetic information that you know, we're about to be flooded with potentially. And what, what, how do you see that as a disruptive force for better or worse in you know, finance? Well, if you look at all the data that's growing out there, one of the fastest areas is the amount of uh, genetic information as a cost of DNA sequencing is uh, dropping the amount of uh, information out there on, on this uh, particular topic is uh, going up and up and up. So uh, th this is going to change things. This, this is going to disrupt things. Uh, ne ne never before has uh, this happened. And uh, you, you, you just have to look at the whole spectrum of information and uh, where is information coming from. You know, uh, if you compare genetic information to, uh, you know, astrophysicist information and uh, other kinds of uh, data out there, this information right now is uh, growing the fastest. So that's an indication that uh, that's where some of the best opportunities are. And do you think that's, uh, that will that, be useful? I mean, it'll obviously be useful in the insurance world where you, people are trying to predict health exposures or life insurance risk or whatever. But is it going to be useful for you as, a, as a, an investor? It, uh, I think it'll be useful in all kinds of areas from uh, insurance world where you predict life expectancy to uh, even uh, social world where based on someone's DNA you can predict how they're going to act in uh, certain ways. It's going to be uh, useful for us and it'll be useful for everybody. Just a uh, very uh, simple thing. Uh, more data is uh, always good. 
and especially uh, the kind of data like uh, DNA that's uh, so rich and it's been around and so close to our hearts. And are genetic data sets being offered now as, as product to investment firms or is that still a way off? I think it's still uh, way off uh, and uh, a lot of data coming out of medical research is very uh, disjointed and one of the first challenges is to uh, unite all this data but uh, it's going to happen and uh, we're actually in the middle of exploring a partnership with a Cornell uh, University where we can combine our methods and, uh, and their data to uh, to produce uh, useful forecasts. Forecasts of, of what sort of things? Of uh, cancers, cancer cures, diseases, and uh, anything else. There are, there are a lot of things that can be forecast. And do you, do you see this trend as well, Hilary? I mean, I think when we talk about genetic data and other healthcare data, the opportunity is not perhaps an investment opportunity, but really one for all of us as human beings to be healthier and have a higher quality of life. And we are seeing a lot of interesting work in um, things like using deep learning to do radiology diagnosis. So there's a startup called Enletic that's been working on this and having a bit of success, right? Um, and this is also interesting, not for those of us, everyone in this room has access to fantastic healthcare, but for people who do not have access to those doctors, being able to have an automated system that is nearly as good as one of those doctors is a huge advancement just in, in you know, for human beings. I think that's an amazing opportunity for all of us. Catherine Hires, I'm a business journalist. How close or far are we from uh, quantum computing truly disrupting finance, you know, cracking all the security codes that banks and other uh, financial organizations use? I mean, I understand that's the capability that we'll have when quantum computing arrives. So, you know, are we preparing for it? And if so, in what way? Here you go. I think that's still uh, a while away. But, uh, you know, once the quantum computing is uh, out there, quantum com computing currently exists on a fairly small scale, you know, th th thousand bits, something like that. So uh, before it can really truly uh, disrupt things like that, it has to get to a new uh, higher level. How, how far is that? Uh, you know, I, I'd have to be a fortune teller to tell you that. So the kind of things that, that, that you're seeing at the moment are, I mean, they're a big improvement on the amount of data they can process, but they don't get anywhere close enough to be able to hack a security code. Not yet. No. Okay. Jesse McWatters, uh, World Economic Forum. Um, I'm curious if any of you have thought about the role of data excludability in fairness in financial markets. We see today where people are doing things like you know, counting cars from satellites to predict, uh, you know, Walmart's returns uh, on a quarterly basis. And, and that's one thing because that data is, is truly publicly available. But what if in the future you have a, a self-driving car network that's able to observe where every car has gone at any given point and the owners of that network are able to uh, front run markets? Um, I'm wondering if there's sort of any thoughts on, uh, you know, how that ability to exclude others from access to your data has implications on fairness. Igor, yeah, I think this is for this you. This for me. As the amount of data grows and grows, and, and, and uh, as the ability to uh, monitor and uh, survey the data grows and grows, we have to really define uh, what's fair and uh, what's not fair. And it's kind of uncharted territory. It's a, uh, we haven't been there yet. So we have to uh, think about this a lot. It's, it's, it's like uh, self-driving cars. You know, what happens in a dangerous situation where the car has to make a decision uh, whether to kill the owner or, for, or to kill two people on the sidewalk. What, 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 what do you do in such a case? So we, we're going to have to face a lot of issues that we haven't 
faced yet. And the number of such issues is uh, very large. So it's a, it's a good question that you bring up, but it's probably too complicated to be uh, handled right here. But it's interesting in the sense, I think that some of these new uh, data products around you know, tracking cars and car parks and things, I mean, that you're now getting into a situation where a, an investor can know pretty much at the same time as, a, as the company it's investing in what its activity is. And I suppose that, is, that a, is that a positive sum game for society to have investors that well informed or is that a... Is that actually a, you know, is, there, is there some advantage to companies or individuals having you know, some proprietary data and what, what can they do with that data? I think this also brings up a, an adjacent but worthwhile point to discuss here, which is that there is an oligarchy of sort of people who have this kind of data and this exists today. There's nothing to stop you, for example, from building your own fleet of vehicles to go collect similar data except the expense. Uh, which is high and probably not rational. And so this is something that is definitely slowing down innovation in this sector because if you're a startup, you have zero data, um, you can't collect it. And so, so we are today dealing with this problem and I don't have an answer to the question, but rather just want to acknowledge that it's a really good question. Maybe the other thing I'll add is, is you know, this, the idea of kind of permission to share data um, you know, the sort of the role of regulators in terms of thinking really on behalf of the individual and saying, look, maybe there's, there's certain elements where we want to not necessarily make information as open as it may be. So I think that there's a factor in there. If I look at more emerging markets, I mean, again, you've got markets, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, which essentially are what I call have jumped directly into digital, a lot of that through newly connected devices. And suddenly you have this segment of the population uh, that is immediately connected and now actually has a sort of wealth of information that could potentially be leveraged. I'm Nan, and I'm a tech investor working for Baidu. Uh, so I have a question regarding the machine learning. I was, as we know that uh, to make the effective machine learning model works, we need a large amount of data to train the model. Um, and, such, and then such machine learning model can be applied on cybersecurity or fraud detections, and things like this. So my question is, um, how can we know that such a model is really effective in terms of this situation? For example, when you use a machine learning model to identify the fraud, fraud uh, transactions or, the, or to make the machine learning model to work, really work on the uh, frequent transaction um, technology. To this, so you don't always need a massive amount of data. It depends on what the application is and whether there's any sort of feedback loop. But to answer that question, one of the things we do is as soon as you can articulate clearly the problem you're trying to solve, the very next thing you should articulate is what a successful error metric is for that problem. Um, and there's no one answer to how do we know when we've been successful. There are quantitative techniques depending on the kind of algorithm or the kind of system you're using. Um, and then sometimes uh, there are no answers. So if you want to look at how, say, Google does their search rank quality, they do a combination of quantitative analysis as well as actually bringing people in to look side by side at different algorithms, rankings, and picking the one that's better. Um, but it is very important in any machine learning product design to know how you're going to know when you have success, and then also to understand what sufficient success looks like. Um, and that's also because when you actually want to deploy something rather than have it in a lab environment, building the simplest possible thing that gives you a sufficient amount of success is uh, going to end up making that ultimate product development cycle a lot simpler and the maintenance a lot simpler. Um, so it's really worth thinking about that right at the beginning. Um, and again, if you're classifying celebrity gossip, which is something I have worked on, maybe you don't care if it's that accurate or not. Um, a spam filter, we, we care, but it's not critical. If you're doing cancer diagnosis, you really do care. And, and so there's a wide range of potentially correct answers to that question. Uh, Ernest van Riet, Capitec Bank. Um, I've just got a, also got a question on machine learning. So if you take, for example, credit scoring. So I understand now you take big sets of data and you use machine learning to help you to predict, you know, which segments of data is predictive okay so now you sit with less segment or less data or predictive data items so now the question is if we just if we ignore regulation for the moment 
can you use machine? So do you still do you use those predictive data elements and still build your credit model in a in a let's say traditional way by somebody looking at it and creating something like a linear regression model? Or can you can the machine learning build the model for you? And then if the answer is yes, um, then it it obviously keeps on learning, and it almost you almost have a different model every day. So how do you know whether that model is performing if it's not stable? I mean that also that I'm sure people are doing that today. Um, it just seems like an obvious application, um, and you would know if it's performing based on you know if you lend money to someone with a given credit score out of a given model, how do they do? Um, and yes, that model can be automated because you hope that the humans doing it have some repeatability, that, that at least there's some consistency across people assigning these credit scores. Um, but credit scores are also a great example of a case where you can understand a population quite well. So um, across the population, the distribution of credit scores is probably very accurate, but in any given individual case, it might be quite wrong. So there is probably quite a good opportunity to do some work there. Probably one of the more active spaces that, that I see in terms of either speaking to lenders or startups, that idea of leveraging other data to essentially, um, essentially enhance the traditional credit scoring model, largely in, in demographics, either millennial segments or underbanked populations. I think for most of what I've seen is the, the traditional institutions today are really using that to supplement versus replace entirely. Um, but that being said, I also have seen startups which are actually doing balance sheet lending themselves and saying, look, we're actually not going to use a traditional credit scoring model, we're going to leverage these other data sources that maybe determine things like cash flow positions, um, and we will be willing to actually take that risk. But I, I think, the, the, you know, at least from a high level, there's clearly an opportunity here in terms of how you enhance the way that credit is viewed uh, today. What you're describing is uh, really uh, not unique to credit scoring, but it's, uh, it's what we call an alpha, it's, 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 it's a prediction. And typically, a prediction is uh, refined based on data. And as new data arrives, you refine your prediction. So every day, it, uh, it changes a little bit. So we're pretty much out of time, and lunch beckons. But I just want to ask each of you to, um, to say, well, we've talked about a lot of technologies and ideas that are going to potentially change finance a lot over the next 10 to 15 years. I wonder if um, each of you could say, you know, what, which one do you think is going to have the biggest impact on either financial services in general or the particular uh, sector you work in uh, over the next 10 years? Uh, Igor, what, 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 what's going to be the biggest dr technological driver of disruption, disruptive change? So it's a combination of things, right? right. One is, of course, uh, data is growing and uh, technology is growing exponentially, and we know that. But another driver is uh, to that talent is getting uh, democratized. And uh, one of the things we no noticed early in WorldQuant, and that's why we have uh, you know, 20 plus offices worldwide, is that uh, talent is distributed statistically globally, but opportunity is not. So over time, we, 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 we're going to see this uh, kind of merging between uh, talent and uh, data and uh, opportunity, and that'll be a really great uh, disruptive force that's, that's just going to change the way uh, people do things, because never before has information flowed, uh, so much information flowed so freely everywhere, and, and anybody had ability to analyze it and uh, act on it. Hillary? And I'll say I think it's the combination of um, the extension of the kinds of analysis we can do now on virtual data um, to the real world. So I think maybe I'll combine everything but quantum computing in one bucket and say it's not any one of these things. It's all of them together plus the addition of things like um, robotics or other systems that will be in our physical environment. Stefan? I, mean, I think there's, there's an element on connectivity, which I think is, is critical, especially from the Internet of Things space. It's, this is really around how information flows in a trusted environment between those devices and then how that can ultimately change and influence uh, the, the consumer experience. I think there's also something around looking internally from an infrastructure standpoint. Uh, you know, it's, again, I speak to a number of banks thinking about shifting to a, a cloud-based environment, uh, expanding the availability of services through APIs. This goes back to the connectivity. That can also help accelerate the speed at which this innovation is going to happen is this, the infrastructure internally has become much more efficient.
Great. Well, I think that's been a very wide-ranging discussion. I think I take away the fact that maybe as humans we're not entirely doomed to be made redundant by technology and that actually this may help some of us do our jobs even better in, in the future. So there's some hope out of this session. Mm -hmm.